an extension of that. I'm thinking that uh, voice communications, cloud communications will be a part of every business continuity conversation going forward. While we hope that this doesn't happen again, this business continuity conversations have to take that into account. So the, the time to plan is before it happens, right? But take sometimes an unfortunate event to kind of people, you know, after 2008, we saw the recession in the housing market and everybody ran to as a service and OPEX and then capital budgets started to kind of get back up and people kind of forgot about those days and then you see this happen. So I think uh, a lot of people put in plans and contingency plans and committees uh, that weren't in place before. We'll give it one more minute and then we'll get rolling. Pretty excited about this presentation. You already did it once today, huh, John, in some form or fashion? Yeah, today's, uh, today ended up just being a, a presentation day. So it was good with work from home. I haircut, shaved, I just had to do it for one day. So I can go back to quarantine tomorrow. So you got a warm up earlier, kind of got to stretch out. <laughs> Where must be the big the, the, the big game today? See, ATC and CBTS saving the best for a second. It's like when you have, you have a surgery, right? And they schedule it. You say, do you want to be first to go on in the morning? You're like, no, I'll let the doctor warm up a little bit. I'll go second. <laughs> yeah, you find the groove. <laughs> Why don't you flip to that next screen here as soon as we hit 105, which is just now. I'll roll into a little bit about us and hand you the mic. How about that? The virtual that mic. Good deal. All right. This is Louie Holmeyer. I'm with ATC, Director of Marketing and Consultant. Welcome everybody today. We are excited to be here with CBTS and John Lloyd and talk next gen IT. Uh, ATC, as many of you know, focused in four core segments, voice, data, cloud, and security. And we, uh, fortunate that we have a great partner here in town, CBTS, and also fortunate that we got a great team and we've been partner of the year, two out of the four years that it's been in place, 2016 and 2019. We pride ourselves on being independent solution agnostic. And uh, while we have a great partner here with CBTS, we also have a portfolio of over 250 plus solution providers. What's unique about CBTS is I think, John, we're kind of born in the old days where, uh, you know, our relationship started when, you know, just based on region, we had to have CBTS, you know, have that relationship. So it kind of started with the CBB and ATC and local partnership. And now today, I think we're both thriving based on expertise and innovation. And now it's CBTS and ATC voice data cloud security, right? So with that in mind, uh, today we're going to talk about the paradigm shifts in the SD-WAN world, particularly the value proposition wrapped around the CBTS Bella Cloud offering, offering, excuse me, Bella Cloud offering, as well as how CBTS has layered security along with a new product from Checkpoint. John, I'm not the uh, technical juggernaut here. I'm going to have to cede that point to you up front. So with that in mind, I'll, I'll hand this to you. Thank you, Louie, and, and thank you. The, the partnership with ATC means so much to us because to Louis's point, it's not just a, a regional, uh, we, the two companies have really grown together. So to, to watch uh, where ATC has been able to grow and, and expand and go deeper into technology buckets within accounts and provide that trusted guidance, that means the world to us because the one thing we don't sell is yes as a service, right? We have no interest. If we're not a good fit, we don't want to take that on. It's not good for our end customers and it's not good for us. And so having partnerships and trusted advisors like ATC, it's very mutually beneficial for you, the end customer, as well as for CBTS. So we really appreciate that partnership uh, and we appreciate everyone taking time to join us today. I know it's a different world and some folks maybe work from home, but I can tell you I've been significantly busier uh, over the last eight weeks. It's almost like time doesn't exist anymore and everything is just one big day. So we do appreciate you taking time out of the day to join us. Uh, Louie hit on what we're gonna cover off, which is really we've seen networking shift and as often you see paradigm shifts in our industry, solving one problem creates two others, and then you have to go solve those problems. So we saw the advent of 
cloud adoption and we had to solve the problem of out-based outcome-based networking and we use SD-WAN to solve that and we're going to talk about that today. Now as everybody's beginning to move and adapt, uh, I would say we're probably at the full adoption rate on SD-WAN. So if you think about your, uh, you know, bleeding edge, leading edge, and then your herd, and then you get your, your tail adopters. I think we're in that herd mentality right now on SD-WAN and we're starting to see that that does pose some security issues. So as my applications leave my network, I build a network designed to connect to those. How do I secure that? And we're gonna cover off on, on some ways to do that today. Um, for those of you who CBTF may be a new name or perhaps you've seen some of our other uh, logos or if you are local to Cincinnati and maybe you're confused with just what is going on uh, from a business standpoint, uh, we really operate in, in two distinct segments. One is our ILEC and entertainment and communications business, which is Cincinnati Bell and Hawaii Telecom. So on the Hawaiian Islands, we are the ILEC as well as locally here in Cincinnati, Ohio, and provide route fiber, um, video services, broadband internet, dedicated internet, et cetera. We then have our global uh, business, which is IT services, strategic, uh, as a service and managed services. So that is CBTS globally uh, with offices in the US, India, and the UK, and then Onyx Canada, which is our same company but operates under a different uh, brand in the Canadian markets. All trades under CBB um, on the New York Stock Exchange. So all one company, but really just different pillars designed to serve our customers in different needs. And we can bring all of this together with one uh, account management and one consultant with an ATC um, who helps across all of these brands. So very fortunate. Specifically, what we partner or strategically focus on within my practice, uh, the communications practice at CBTS is our hosted UCAS and contact center as a service, uh, multiple platforms to meet multiple needs, our network as a service, which is a full stack utility co-managed Meraki model, and then our SD-WAN practice, which is obviously very strategic. Our flagship offering inside of that is VeloCloud. We're gonna talk a lot about them today. Uh, and then also a security as a service platform, which is an OpEx co-managed, uh, utilizing Checkpoint Cloud Guard Connect and how that integrates with SD-WAN. We're hitting on VeloCloud and Checkpoint today. Um, I think that's a, a very strategic message. However, a lot of these products complement each other. And as we see customers move to SD-WAN from MPLS or move to cloud security from on-prem, there oftentimes still is an opportunity to refresh uh, switch stacks or wireless networking or uh, telephony. And, and Louie and I were talking about it before the call, but this new world of how do I go to work from home, uh, UCAS and CCAS and WebEx have been a significant part of doing so. Uh, so I wanted to share that with you while we're not necessarily focusing on it today. Uh, it is a strategic part of what we do. How we got to where we're at today, because the whole focus is a paradigm shift. And along the way, feel free, uh, use that chat space. If we can answer it in rhythm, I will. I am monitoring it. Uh, if not, we'll save time for the end uh, and address them. But uh, John, I, I got a quick question for you. Uh, sure. What was your, yeah, give me your perspective, you know, because you got this Cisco as a service play. Uh, what, what were your thoughts when, Cisco bought Broadsoft because you've been there as well for a while, right? Yeah, so for it's to, to take a, a deeper dive into the, the UKAS and the Cisco platform space. So uh, we were a traditional Broadworks shop. Broadworks is uh, Broadsoft, it's a product of Broadsoft. So Broadsoft is the company that Cisco bought. Broadworks was when a service provider manages, maintains, and hosts their own uh, soft switching environment. So we were our own uh, telephony company, obviously, as the phone company, uh, and then Broadsoft was acquired by Cisco. For us, what's great about that is there was two really parallel tracks. We had an HCS, which is Cisco's call manager in the cloud for enterprise, typically a thousand handsets and above, and then Broadsoft was really a uh, mid-market play of under a thousand handsets. There were certain feature sets within one or the other. One was being multi-tenanted, one was not. So Cisco buying Broadsoft, what it's done is allowed us to take a lot of synergies and take things like WebEx um, platforms for um, what we're on today, right? Where we don't have the same security vulnerabilities of other more popular work from home conferencing platforms. Uh, we're able to take things like video units and integrate all of this into one platform. So for us, there was a lot of synergy between Broadsoft and HCS. 
and Cisco buying them just begins to unify, uh, and which is really focused on taking the enterprise feature set and driving it down to the SMB price point. So for us, it was really a match made in heaven that the two bought, or Cisco bought Broadsoft because we were already working in unison with both of them. Thank you. So on the, the networking side, where how we got to where we're at today. Typically, organizations would build out networks, and we call this MPLS. If you're regional, this might be layer two VPLS or ELINE, ELAN, EPL, depending on who that provider is. But the concept is expensive private networks. And the concept here is I've got multiple sites, and I'm going to tie them back to a data center, or maybe two for a disaster recovery. And inside of this data center, all of my applications are going to live. So rather than putting a phone system at 10 sites, I'm going to build one phone system and I'm going to connect back to it. And rather than putting an email server, right, and not so forth and so on. Over time, what started to happen was the first adoption into the cloud. You had your early adopters, but then Office 365 and G Suite came along, and very few businesses continue to operate with an on-prem model for email. And then virtual data center companies came along. CBTS, we launched our VDC in 2007, and the, the concept of pay for compute when you need it. You don't operate on the weekends, so why build out servers and pay for capacity to run 24-7 when you're not going to run 24-7. And then the SaaS. The SaaS really changed the cloud adoption game where people said, I'll never move to the cloud, I want all my data, all of a sudden realizing that there were these giant platforms, whether it's ServiceNow for ITSM or Workday for HR management, Bamboo in that category, Salesforce, uh, CRM. Why build it myself, have to own it, maintain it, patch it, SaaS came along and pushed a lot of things out to the cloud. We've obviously been talking about UCAS and, and CCAS and why build a phone system that's reliant on a data center when I can have this live in the cloud and have my employees work from anywhere. And you picked whatever the different line of business application was, AWS, Azure, uh, now Google Platform, we see this takeover for those payloads moving out of the network. And so all of a sudden what we're left with is this MPLS network connecting back to a data center to just go out to the internet because we're seeing less and less application in that data center. We're also seeing less and less branches, and this is you know a significant difference in the last eight weeks, which is branch one and branch two really can be called employee one and employee two uh, with this nomadic or distributed workforce, whether that be from home or even in the previous world of Starbucks or Panera, right? Uh, the one component, though, as we start to see the shift of I want to design a network to connect a person to an application, no longer a building to a building, that's what we use SD-WAN for. We then have our network as a service, which I mentioned was our full stack Meraki offering. So we still, where we have physical buildings, we're still going to have a need for switches to connect access points to deliver Wi-Fi, to connect our physical phones if we do have them, to connect printers, to connect workstations that aren't uh, on wireless, right, things like printers, uh, for example which could be wireless, but typically you don't want to do that for performance reasons. Uh, and then you may still have in your data center, maybe you have routers for public facing services, internet um, routers for failover, things like that. Those have to be physical, but the control plane doesn't have to live there. And so what we did was we built our network as a service, which is uh, a OpEx model where we provide Meraki routing, switching, access points, and co-management of this whole platform. We're going to talk about first this world, um, and then we're going to talk about what happened when the firewall is no longer in the data center. So the first thing that we typically, the three main questions, we're going to cover the first one. What about applications? My MPLS gave me a QoS policy. I bought QoS from my carrier, and it was private, and so I had this great experience. You're telling me to remove MPLS and use Internet as transport. How do we do this reliably? So the first thing is to understand that SD-WAN is a very crowded space. There's 66 different SD-WAN vendors. They are not all created the same, um, and they aren't necessarily one better than another. They're, they have specific use cases uh, that we're going to talk about today, specifically the Magic Quadrant Leader, VMware, which is Velo Cloud SD-WAN. VMware acquired them about two years ago. Uh, CBTS, we went and did our own testing, so we've been doing this since 2016. We were the second ever service provider with VeloCloud. This was long before VMware bought them. And we really looked at what is the impact with real-time applications like VoIP over lossy environments like Internet. We saw that VMware, at the time VeloCloud was the big winner. 
Three years later, Gardner came out with their Magic Quadrant and found the same thing. And during that time, the revenue and market share uh, from uh, IHS market matched that as well. So uh, again, there's not a one's better than another. There's what is the use case for one versus the other. They all kind of have their own unique niche. The use case of why Velo Cloud. So the first concept is a single link. Replacing MPLS with two links or replacing MPLS with three links may not be cost advantageous. One of the, it may for some sites, depending on how you're set up today and depending on what the job function of that site is, but we're carrier agnostic, we're transport agnostic. We're gonna create an overlay tunnel, so a site to another site, regardless of what that transport is. That can be Spectrum Internet, it can be Cincinnati Bell Internet, it can be Comcast, it can be LTE, it can be MPLS if you do need to keep that in some sites. But most SD-WAN works under the idea of choose path A or path B, whichever one's working better. And VeloCloud said, well, one, what if I don't have two paths? What if my second path doesn't exist or if it's an LTE for failover and I wanna keep my usage down because uh, I don't wanna have to pay a large LTE bill? What do we do to protect traffic over a single internet link? And that's where they came up with packet-based routing as opposed to flow-based. So in a lossy environment, up to 40% packet loss over a single link, VeloCloud's actually duplicating that traffic and inserting, so this is well more, if, if you're familiar with forward error correction, it's doing well more than just basic FEC, uh, it is actually duplicating the packets. The other concept as we look at VeloCloud, so we know it can enhance an application over a single link, obviously it can do that over dual links, but what happens if I put VeloCloud in my branch and my data center, that doesn't help me when I go out to the internet. And that's really the key difference in the SD-WAN space. A lot of the competitors to VeloCloud have uh, come up with packet-based routing and started to catch up from feature sets. However, we've got to take this concept and extend it, and we're gonna talk about that. So what you're looking at here is what VeloCloud is able to do over a poor performing link. Up top is I've got two different links, and I'm in real time going to be able to steer traffic and steer sessions over which one's performing better. Typically, your MPLS is gonna perform better than a cable modem based off of jitter, latency, and packet loss. But it may go down, and that's that gray area you see. Even during those times, what is able to do is one, keep that flow up. You're not gonna drop a phone call if you lose that MPLS or if you have two ISP links. But also, it's able to correct for the jitter, latency, and packet loss so this is a, what they call a quality of experience or a QOE score, scored out of 10. And you can see each link independently, uh, the cable one is almost un, is unusable and the MPLS is certainly falling below thresholds, uh, but we're delivering close to a perfect experience. Also what we're doing is holding our MPLS and internet providers accountable. Now, if you have a broadband, there may not be SLAs, but on dedicated internet, on MPLS, you have thresholds and SLAs guaranteed in your contract for packet loss and round trip latency and jitter within the network. So for the first time, we're really able to go back and hold an ISP or hold a carrier accountable rather than it's testing clean. The bottom one we're looking at is really the, the bread and butter for VeloCloud, and that is a single link. So if I think retail, if I've got 10 sites, 50 sites, the idea of adding a second link can be very costly. And so in this model, oftentimes we'll do is a single internet link and then an LTE as a backup. That way it's there, I'm not losing revenue if my non-SLA driven circuit goes down, but we're not utilizing it all the time and driving up uh, that LTE usage point. So what's happening is as the link is starting to have delay and packet loss and jitter, VeloCloud is doing two things. It's duplicating the packets, but it's also got a unique header that is going to slow down and bring all the traffic to within the same jitter uh, thresholds well within the latency thresholds. And that's, we can take a, a deeper dive one-on-one -on -one for your organization and how it would impact your applications, but wanted to share kind of that linked treatment, how it's protecting those applications. So it's always monitoring those links. You can set packet uh, steering by application. So maybe you have an expensive dedicated circuit and a cheap broadband, and you want guest Wi-Fi to go over broadband, but if that goes down, let's not take up our corporate expensive uh, DIA circuit. You have that ability to create a policy-based quality of service by application, uh, typically with voice and video being the most sensitive. Hey John, I got a question for you. Absolutely. So 
if I'm not mistaken, you did a lot of lab testing with various SD WAN flavors, right? It's kind of all ice cream, but different flavors. Uh, that was pretty extensive, I'm not mistaken, before you landed on the Velo. Is that correct? Yeah, so at the time we, we had, this was back in 2016, we brought in at the time what was the top 10 SD WAN uh, vendors in, in that kind of segment, and we wrote a test plan, gave each vendor seven days to set up their lab, and then seven days to run through their testing. And we scored them, there was 10 different tests, and we scored and ranked how they performed. So there were some vendors that said we can't even participate in that test. There were some that said, you know, we don't want to participate in that test. There were some that tried and failed. So uh, VeloCloud was the only one that passed all 10 tests. And in the tests where multiples passed, we ranked performance. So for example, packet loss um, and voice survivability, the third place vendor had their phone call drop at 12% packet loss. The, the next one was 14% packet loss. VeloCloud was 40, 40% packet loss before the phone call became unusable. So uh, it was not a light decision that we came to. And the nice thing is at the time, SD-WAN, there was no big conglomerate. There was no big 800 pound gorilla or OEM, you know, in the space that was saying, well, it needs to integrate to my products or ELAs or any of that. We really just made a decision based off of the technology and how it can help and impact our customers. I always felt like that was a good story, how thorough you guys were up front. Yeah, it was not a, it was not a, you know, well, we already do business with OEM, A, B, or C, and, and so just add that to the contract, right? It was a, it was a really fun process to get to, to go greenfield and, and truly not be beholden to any kind of, you know, contracts or politics or any of the other stuff that I'm sure everybody's familiar with. So. Yeah, a, um, a true, a true bake-off, like we used to say in the old days. <laughs> correct. Uh, now, for, for customers, it, it's extensive. So we always, when we do bake-offs with customers, we try to get it down to one or two, you know, do one um, SD-WAN and do a, a proof of concept or maybe two and do a bake-off. Bringing in 10 vendors and running tests for two weeks is disruptive to your business. <laughs> uh, but for us as a service provider, obviously it was mission critical. Uh, awesome. As we look at your business, one of the things when I, I talk with our customers about our co-management of, of a platform, in the past, you had to decide if you wanted control and responsibility or if you wanted help. So if I went to a managed service provider, I was going to not, no longer have access to the network. I could maybe see reports, but I was at their mercy. But if I wanted control, I also had to accept the fact that I was getting up at midnight when an alarm went off. And so we built this co-management model where we're there 24-7, 365, and you can call us or you can do things yourself. And we really want you to. We want you to go in and small tweaks and change IP addresses and all of those things that you probably want control in your network, you don't have to do it yourself. We can gladly do it. But what I can't, you know, commit to is a 30 second window to get an IP address changed if I've, you know, got a P1 and a, a site down for another customer. So we give you that control, but we really give you back your nights and weekends. So we have some customers who call us for everything and that's great. I'd say that's probably 90% of our customers. Uh, we have 8% of our customers that we have a really healthy balance um, where they do the things they're comfortable with. And then we have 2% that like to, to really stretch us and, and they go in and tinker and then we have to go in and fix. But those are still great customers because now we've enabled them and they've learned what went wrong and, and how to fix that in the future. So it's kind of a, a really a great joint partnership. But part of that responsibility for us is giving you back visibility being able to show you how a link is performing, being able to show you in real time how many of your sites are up or down or where you have problems or where things are degraded but not down. And so this single pane of glass to be able to see through your entire network, not just how the site is up or down, but how each link, if it's up or down, or how each link is performing or what applications are bogging down your network. A lot of times we get on the IT side, you get a phone call from somebody in accounting who says, it's slow, the network is slow. And you have to try to figure out what they mean by that or why that is. Application visibility to come in and say, well, I've got Spotify using 1.55 gig of the network. That's an issue, I'm gonna create a policy and I'm gonna black hole Spotify, I'm gonna block that. And we're gonna free up the network for uh, the other applications that are mission critical. So giving you that visibility into how your network's performing, but really how your network's being used 
Um, the other thing is we call this the mean time to innocence. So as the IT person, if an application is performing poorly, it's always the network. And depending on your organization, that might be a one-stop shop. But a lot of organizations have an application team, they have a network team, they might have a voice team. And so this is the network team's mean time to innocence to be able to show you from end to end, it is not the network. So we really need to go and look at how's that, uh, what's the distribution of that application, how's it architected, et cetera. So we know how we're able to show you how the network's performing. We talked about how we're able to show you how a link is performing, how we're able to correct an application flow across that link. All of that requires, obviously, a bookend. I have to have site A and site B. So that can be your data center and your branch, or a branch and a branch. But what about those applications that leave the network? Well, one is we're going to extend that same capability all the way into your PaaS and IaaS. Uh, your platform as a service and infrastructure as a service in AWS, Azure, and also now Google Platform. So we are in GPC, and we have the ability, rather than connecting over a, a VPN tunnel into your cloud atmosphere, we literally put a virtual Velo Cloud in your specific instance that is going to do the same thing around understanding link performance, available routes, steering traffic, tech packet duplication, et cetera. But what about applications like SaaS? I talked about how Salesforce really moved everybody to the cloud at a much more expeditious pace. So we talked about Velo's packet-based routing. That was the first differentiator that some have caught up to. The second is the idea of, of a distributed gateway architecture. So what you're looking at is gateways deployed globally that will allow you to extend your network into the public internet. So rather than into your cloud environment, if you're going to salesforce.com, what's going to happen is we're going to bookend that traffic all the way from your branch into a Velo Cloud Gateway, which is then connected into the CDNs or the Cloud Distribution Network. What that enables me to do is understand all the way from my branch to salesforce.com, how is the link performing? Where is there congestion? Is there a secondary ISP? If I have two links, is my Cincinnati Bell path to Salesforce better than my Spectrum or vice versa. Um, though I have to plug that. I have to make sure we, we put Cincinnati Bell first. But you get the concept. We may have upstream issues on one ISP or another. And so that ability to understand an application as it's leaving my network, but being able to bookend it all the way uh, to understand that. The other thing is uh, geo-based routing. So when you go to salesforce.com, it's going to return on a geo lookup the closest salesforce.com instance to you. Uh, that doesn't necessarily mean it's close, and it obviously doesn't mean it's protected. What this does is it uses the geo lookup of the Velo Cloud Gateway. So when I want to go to salesforce.com, let's say that's sitting in Chicago, I'm going to be bookended from my office in Cincinnati to that gateway in Chicago, and then it's going to return Salesforce in Chicago back to that gateway. So I've literally protected myself from Cincinnati to Chicago all the way across that internet link. The Velo Cloud gateway difference, that is the one component uh, that none of the 65 other SD-WAN carriers have been able to catch up to. So when I talk about Velo Cloud and, and all the SD-WANs having specific use cases or things they're good at, if you're an organization that's looking to replace expensive dedicated bandwidth with broadband or multiple internet links, but doesn't want to invest in DIA at every site or doesn't want to have to have two links at every site. Or if you're an organization that says, I've been moving applications to the cloud or I've been buying more SaaS applications. Internet is transport, cloud SaaS. Those are the big differentiators for VeloCloud, which stands to reason why they're the largest in revenue share. Because my guess is if you interviewed 100 businesses and said, are you looking to save money and do you use SaaS, you get 99 of those 100 saying, yes, that sounds a lot like me. That's a, the differentiating story of VeloCloud. I'm going to pause there because we have two other questions. Is If you're going to send my applications out to this Velo Gateway directly from my branch or our home office, we're doing a lot of work from home with VeloCloud now, that's great, but I've got to secure that and where do my firewalls go and how do people get through security. That's where we're going to shift next. But I'm going to stop on the SD-WAN piece and take a pause to see if we have any questions. You did a nice job of covering that. Thank you. Perfect. So I'm 
you're going to see it's kind of a different iteration of uh, the slide we started with SD-WAN. We've already talked about why connecting branches to MPLS to, to just go out the internet is no longer going to be useful, right? So we replaced that with these Velo clouds and we put in SD-WAN and we said use internet as transport. But customers came back and said, well, but my firewall only exists at my data center because I was on a private network. And so I need a way to secure that. So we did what was called internet backhaul and we would just Basically, we kept the same network design, but we removed from the network MPLS and replaced it with cheaper connectivity. Well, then customers started to say, well, I'm getting performance complaints still, right? I moved all this stuff to Salesforce and I thought moving to a big internet pipe from a small MPLS pipe would be better. And so we started to create business policies to send it direct. That would say, all of my traffic comes back to my data center unless you want to go to Salesforce or unless you want to go to Office 365 or Google Cloud or Dropbox. Um, and that's where the current network sits, right? So two decades of MPLS, we're now iterating so quickly that every time we solve a problem, we're looking uh, to, at two, three new problems. That's where our Cloud Guard Connect comes in. So there's a couple of things we need to do. One, we need to, to protect the application as far, to the net, as far through the network into the cloud as possible, which means we also need to secure it. So not just protect performance, but also protect from a security standpoint. The second thing that we need to do is we need to understand that applications, every time you go to Office 365, you can go to a different IP address. You can go to a different availability zone or geo zone. You, for the most part, will always stay within the same country, but depending. Uh, we need to be able to not only protect the performance and the security, but we need to protect it as close to that application as possible, not as close to your site as possible. And so using Cloud Guard Connect, we plug those into that Velo Gateway architecture that I talked about. So Velo to Velo Gateway is over an encrypted tunnel. Velo Gateway builds an IPsec to Cloud Guard Instance 1 and Cloud Guard Instance 2, who will still do the same geo NAT and the geo lookup that I talked about as far as returning the best path of that application. Why is it important for you, for customers to start looking at it? So this is Gardner's analysis prior to COVID. These numbers are at least doubled, if not tripled. The concept is I, my applications are distributed. I don't want, I want to connect directly to them for the best performance, but I don't want to have to, if I have 20 branches, I don't want 20 firewalls. The other concept is I've got a, a problem where I've got to be able to connect securely into my different IS platforms. I, which today is over the internet. If we use VeloCloud, it's not over the with internet is transport, but it's encrypted. Also, you see more and more security posturing no longer being a box. It's not a firewall. It's a firewall, and then which features, and then which environments, and which licensing, and that's where you get to this expensive ELA or enterprise license agreement, where you have to buy an entire suite of services to what used to be a firewall is now eight different SKUs from an OEM. The other concept is I've got this huge take rate on SD-WAN. If SD-WAN is really growing because I need to connect to cloud services, what is the point of coming back into my data center? So you can see over the next, at this point, really three years, we're going to see 20% was the projected, 50% when it came to SD-WAN customers. My guess is that number is significantly higher. When we went to work from home, as an IT company, not necessarily our offices ourselves, but the number one complaint we got from customers is, how do I get back into my network? My bandwidth at the data center was not set up for this. My hardware for my firewalls was not set up for a thousand employees coming back in. I don't have enough licenses. I bringing people over VPN to my data center to just go through my firewall and go out to the internet anyway. In our new model, we put a Velo Cloud at home over your regular home internet. I don't need a static IP and I automatically have connectivity into the rest of my VeloCloud site. I have connectivity into my VeloCloud gateway, and I have secure connectivity into Checkpoint Cloud Guard Connect. I'm able to scale literally home by home, employee by employee, without capital expense, and with a predictable fixed OPEX model. Checkpoint is over 25 years of industry leader. For those who really kind of focus on the security space, Typically, a security OEM is partnered with one uh, testing company, and so you'll see them tout the one that always seems to, to promote them the highest. Where we like Checkpoint is they're agnostic. They're unilaterally across Gardner, NSS Labs, IDC, Forrester, all of them independently recognize Checkpoint as an enterprise security industry leader. 
what we bring to the table when I mentioned the idea of these enterprise license agreements and bolting on all these different uh, products and features, we wanted to remove that. We don't think you should have to build a cafeteria menu to keep your network secure. And so we bring one package, and in that you can see the different steps or tiers, and that would be the different sites that would have um, the different license associated. With CBTS and ACC, we bring to you, do you want cloud security? And we're going to turn on all of these features for you for one, one license. What, why is that important? Aside from the ease, when I talk about they're, cert, they're the only vendor certified at 100% catch rate, so that takes all of those different components. It takes sandblast, with there's sandblasting and threat emulation. It takes SSL inspection. It takes all of those components to equal threat cloud, which is the only one with 100% catch rate. They identify zero-day attacks in three to five minutes. So. When something new comes out, within five minutes, Threat Cloud's on it and got it blocked in your network. And what we don't want to do is water down a, a solution to get to a competitive price point and leave you exposed. So what we did was work with Checkpoint to water down the price, not the solution, and bring an all-in license to you. So we give you the best of both worlds. You get all of the feature sets that you would have spent hundreds of thousands of dollars in your data center to build out multiple platforms for IPS, and then for firewalling, and then for anti-bot, and for antivirus. We bring all of that to you. For those of you who say, well, I've already got this, I use a proxy, which is when you stand up a network, uh, a host has to go to a, an internet proxy for security. That doesn't help when other people come into your network, right, and they bring their devices. This is a catch-all IPsec, and so we're able to prevent shadow IT, we're able to send printers this way because we don't have to set a proxy on devices that really don't support proxying. Um, and it's cloud-based, so we're able to bring quickly new features without having to upgrade your hardware. We're able to scale um, from a standpoint of throughput, so we can set up a site in less than five minutes. I don't have to roll a truck. Remember, we're building the tunnel off of a Velo Cloud Gateway. So for a site that's already got Velo Cloud, I just add a tunnel for you, the end customer. So I don't have to interrupt your business. Because of the number of POPs or points of presence that we have across the, the globe, there's under 50 milliseconds of latency. Because we build two tunnels, there's a 5.9 SLA on uptime. Because it's cloud-based, we can easily make configuration and policy changes without impacting the network. Uh, we're able to do those in a what we would consider a dev environment and then push to production. And then the integration is automated, so we can build that one tunnel from VeloCloud rather than a tunnel from each site. If you're familiar with this industry, you're probably seeing names like Zscaler or Palo Alto and their Prisma platform. So a couple of things of why we really like Checkpoint. So the first one that jumps off the page is security, the, the catch rate. 100% catch rate with NSS, uh, obviously you can't beat that. When we look at the, the simplified management of unified policy, the ability to create one policy template and apply it to all of your sites to give you that ease of management. A five nines uptime, something that, would, that Palo Alto doesn't offer simply because of the number of pops. Latency being guaranteed under 50 milliseconds as opposed to Zscaler at 100 or nothing guaranteed from the Palo Alto side. And then the per site performance and the throughput and that ability to help you grow. This is a key component of the cloud. Today, if you have a hardware-based firewall, it's got some limitation of 50 meg, 200 meg, 500 meg throughput. And as you turn more knobs and turn more features like VPN or SSL, that number shrinks and it gets lower and lower. Meanwhile, your internet carriers are coming to you and saying, I can give you 500 meg for $80 a month, right? Broadband's become a commodity. This allows you to take advantage of that higher bandwidth tier without having to buy some gigantic box. We allow you to scale up, not only from a feature set standpoint, but from a throughput standpoint. Hey, John. Yes, sir. Uh, i tell you what, this is pretty strong stuff. I like it, you're not coming in with a bunch of marketing fluff, and that's coming from a, a core marketer. <laughs> <laughs> and I will say, I, correct me if I'm wrong, but uh, Checkpoint, they're a top partner, top right quadrant, if not the top, on the right-hand side of that quadrant, uh, Gardner Magic Quadrant, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, so Gardner's Magic Quadrant, um, there's a couple of different flavors of it. Uh, the one that's probably the most industry recognized is, is simply the next-gen firewall Magic Quadrant. 
um, which is you know, Unified Threat Management, and that's Checkpoint, Palo Alto, and Fortinet are the three vendors in that quadrant. Gotcha. Thank you for that. Uh, I, got a, I, got a, I got a quiz here for you at the end. Okay. <laughs> I look forward to the, to the pop quiz. Always, always makes the, uh, the presenter nervous. Uh, I think it'll be fine. But similar to the Velo Cloud and how we want to show you how your network's performing and what it's doing and hold us accountable, we do the same thing with reporting from a security standpoint. What are the sites that are being blocked? Where are people trying to send traffic to? Where are your threat vectors? What does your security logs look like? Who's been making changes? And we're able to share this with our customer. We do this, again, in a co-managed environment, so you can come in and make changes if you want or open a ticket with us to do it for you. Uh, but to me, reporting from a security standpoint is mission critical. Uh, there's a lot of firewalls out there that you set it and forget it and hope it's doing what it's supposed to do, and you basically find out the hard way when it isn't. Being able to present back to the business the value that you're adding of how many attacks were blocked, how many IPS sessions were, were able to be blocked, what sites uh, are using the most bandwidth, or how much, how many traffic, how much traffic you blocked, that all of that is mission critical data back to the business. There's a bolt-on component that we talk about with the Cloud Guard. So that is designed for traffic leaving our network. But we know inbound, as we move to 365 and Salesforce, when you get an email on your phone, that's coming into you. You don't go out and get it, right? And you're not on the network. You can be on LTE. And so we've got a challenge. If somebody sends me an email, that email can contain a very dangerous file, and how do I protect that? And so we use CloudGuard SaaS that builds an API from the CloudGuard instance we shared with you into these providers in the cloud. And so instead of pushing that email to you, it'll push it through CloudGuard SaaS where they can do things like uh, identity protection if you're integrated with a single sign-on provider. They can check the risk profile of where it's coming from, who the sender is. Is this a, a known domain? And then they can do their, their bread and butter, which is that threat emulation, that threat cloud we talked about. So they can check for zero-day threats. They can detonate an attachment in their sandblast. They can look for shadow IT and data leaks, right? And then they can deliver that to you, already secure, already protected. So this is really protecting those inbound threats from the cloud, all done from the same intuitive cloud management platform. And so it's one platform where you can protect not only your network, but protect your employees, even when they're not on uh, your network or using your device. If you have an employee that accesses Salesforce from a personal device, you want this kind of protection to make sure. So this is that, you'll hear hot buttons like CASB or Cloud Access Security Brokerage, which is really just looking at traffic inspection. This takes it CASB to a whole new level where we're actually blocking zero day attacks and we're actually detonating the same way we would as a full firewall. Support is obviously important. Uh, CBTS, we provide tiers one through three of support. Uh, and then we rely, we have the, there's multiple tiers you can purchase from Checkpoint uh, and their TAC. We have the premium. So we have all of the highest level support. We have around the, the clock, follow the sun support. Um, all upgrades are included in our support, all patches, all releases, the 24 seven support. So we're your first line of defense locally. If we run into a bug issue or a code that needs to be patched, we have that access directly to Checkpoint. So. You're not going to, you don't have to worry about, am I in compliance or out of compliance? There's no more hardware refresh. There's no more licensing upgrades. It's a set it and forget it, priced by the user or priced by bandwidth. So we're able to create that flexibility. Palo Alto is only by bandwidth. Zscaler is only by user. The team at ATC will work with you, identify what is that right fit for your organization? What is the right combination of SD-WAN, of security, of CloudGuard SaaS, et cetera? Um, from a chat, if we're already using CBTS, SD-WAN, NAS, and UCAS, how would one estimate what the cost of adding checkpoint would be? It's a great question. So the, the pricing is based off of either user or bandwidth, and that can be done differently by site. So when we price by bandwidth, if you look at the total utilization of all of your sites, if it's um, 200 meg of throughput, there's a monthly cost, it's $12 a month per meg or per user, and you can change this site by site. So think of a retail site that might have 
you know, three workstations in it, but 10 employees or 50 employees across three different shifts. There you probably want to do per employee or you know, per user because it'd be their point of sale, right? There's only a few ingress, egress points out to the network. But maybe you have a larger office environment where you've got 400 employees, but a 100 meg internet pipe, uh, and it'd be more cost effective there. So we would scale it and find out what is the right fit. The other thing that's different with Checkpoint is we looked across the industry and we've, it's similar, Louie mentioned the testing with the Velo Cloud. We've done a lot of testing with these providers. We've looked at all the different business cases. Checkpoint will never drop your traffic. So if you said we want 100 meg of throughput, one, it's dynamically allocated across all of your sites. Whereas with Prisma, if you have 10 sites and you want 100 meg, you have to decide is it 10 per site? Is it five at this site, five at this site, 20 at that site? Checkpoint just says here's 100 meg. And as, so that's very important, especially if you're across multiple time zones or you have different job functions or different busy times by site. But also we're not gonna drop the traffic like Prisma does. So when you have 100 meg and you send 101, you're gonna get charged that month for 101. There's not a burst rate, there's not an additional charge. Um, it's more for scalability of the network and that's why we have a, here's what our contracted rate is. Uh, but we're never going to drop your traffic. We'll just true it up. If you want to put a throttle on it so that can't happen, we could do that as well. Uh, but most organizations had rather pay the extra $12 a meg, uh, but, but not drop my traffic. Yep. Implementation is super easy for an existing CBTS SD-WAN customer because we build the tunnel off of the Velo gateway. So if you're already an SD-WAN customer, I don't have to roll a truck to your site. Uh, to cut over to this. And also, we can do segmentation and build all, out different labs, so we would have the ability to, you know, test your policies. It's a very hands-off uh, cutover experience for our existing customers. Yeah, that's a good segue into my first pop question. You ready? I'm ready. Pop quiz me. <laughs> okay, we're going to roll back to VeloCloud. What if uh, um, my UCAS uh, isn't CBTSs? Yeah, so we have uh, VeloCloud built in as gateways bookending the CBTS UCAS, right? So we're going to protect that traffic all the way. You may have a UCAS provider that is not us. If that's the case, we'd love to talk to you about it, but also we'd still love to help protect that traffic. And so what happens is when you're connecting to uh, a cloud-based session border controller of a UCAS provider, there is a registration from your IP address at your site. So there's two issues that we have. First is, if voice is mission critical to you, you, not only are you sending it over the internet unprotected, but also you're sending it over the internet with a SIP registration of the IP address of link A. If link A fails, you can still place an outbound call uh, over link B, but inbound calls will not reach you because the SIP registration was going to take at least five minutes to time out to recognize that it needs to, that it's going to accept a new registration. So. We do two things. We bookend from your site to the Velo Cloud gateways, which is enhancing your traffic as far as possible. So let's say if you're in Cincinnati and your provider is in New York, is your hosted voice provider. We're going to bookend the traffic to a gateway in New York and stay protected as long as possible. But the other thing is that provider in New York is going to see the source IP or the SIP registration coming from the IP address of that Velo Cloud Gateway. So you can hang off of your local site as many internet connections as you want. You can put two, you can put three, you can have an LTE as a failover, and we'll still be able, it doesn't change your registration with your provider. So what we are able to do, even if we aren't the voice provider, is not only protect it as far as when internet's performing poorly, we're able to protect it when internet is no longer available without dropping the call. Great question though. And what are your, you got me. You got me nervous when you when you uh, primed it with a pop quiz. That one wasn't too bad. All right, here's here's a pop one for you. When was ATC founded? Hmm. That is a good question. I am gonna guess. I don't know the exact answer, but uh, I feel I, like you guys. You're pretty. You're saw pretty. You just hit your uh, 20 year anniversary, if I'm not mistaken. Am I right? 20 years. Yes. Yes, sir. And you guys were a proud partner of that event. <laughs> That's so, what I thought. I, Mike, I, I, so, I thought it was twenty, but I didn't want to. I didn't want to date you, Louie, or or Mr. Goodwin. 
<laughs> okay, good. I'll, I'll I'll roll back to the technology one more with SD WAN. How about that? Here here you go. Can you connect to a third party vendor's data center? We can. So this is actually um, this is one of the great use cases. We did a big um, interview with the CEO from Velo Cloud and one of the founders. Uh, his name's Sanjay Opal, and I did an interview with him for some blog. This is the key differentiator in this work from home moment right now. We see there's other organizations that say, you know, let's take Meraki, let's put a Meraki Z3 or an MX device out at the, the home or a small business appliance to extend the network. The problem in doing that is I need inside of my data center, I need to already have a concentrator. I need to already be a Meraki shop, then I can start putting Meraki's out at your house which by the way, the Z3 was manufactured in China and has been out of stock and won't be back for a very long time. The unique thing with VeloCloud, the same way we're building an IPsec tunnel to uh, Checkpoint CloudGuard Connect instance, I can build that tunnel to anything. So we have several customers who said, help, we were an MPLS customer, we hadn't moved to SD-WAN, or maybe we moved to somebody else's SD-WAN and we're not on VeloCloud and now I've got 500 employees that have gone to work from home. What we did was built one IPsec tunnel from the Velo Gateway into the customer's data center, their Cisco ASA, their Cisco ASR, uh, their Fortinet firewall, whatever their IPsec device was. And then from there, we hung 500 work from home Velo clouds. And so we sent a 10 meg Velo cloud out to everybody's home as a company. They plugged in their home internet, and all of a sudden, they had connectivity back into their network. So in that case, it wasn't a third party, it was the actual company, but the same logic exists. This is a great way to create one static tunnel that's built out with cloud redundancy, and then you can hang as much redundancy off of your site as you want. Multiple ISPs, failover ISPs, LTEs, et cetera. That flexibility is one of those strengths of the cloud gateway story, and it's been huge for enabling work from home. Uh, also, as people have been using WebEx and Zoom and have moved to those hosted UC applications, the desktop voice clients, having that Velo Cloud at home over your strained internet as all of your neighbors are working from home, you know, and when you take those concepts and combine them, how do I protect UCAS even if it's not CBTSs? How do I connect back into the network even if I wasn't an existing Velo customer? And how do I connect to third-party resources or a third-party data center? All of that gets answered with VeloCloud, and that's been our number one tool uh, outside of the obvious, you know, UCAS. Velo has been our number one tool in helping our customers adjust to this work from home with very little notice for a very extended period of time. I'll tell you what, John, if somebody asks you what time it is, you tell them how to make a watch. And that's great for some <laughs> <laughs> that's great for some tech junkies. Yeah, David, you already stole my next question, which is who is the founder of ATC? And that's David Goodwin, he's on here. But here's here's my next uh, ATC pop question. How many times have we been partner of the year? Oh, I pay attention, Louie. That's a two time winner, 2016 and 2019. Uh, and we I, we started the, the partner of the year program four years ago. So you guys are You've won it twice already in, in four potential years and current reigning partner of the year. Yep, we're going to try and keep, we're definitely trying to keep it rolling. Tell you what, we'll, we'll go back and we'll ask you one more checkpoint question, if that's all right. Uh, and then we'll get this wrapped up since we're about four minutes away from the top of the hour. And you already alluded to this a little bit, but I want to go back to it since it's kind of uh, hits on mobile workers. So would a mobile worker outside the office have the same protection as inside the office? At the checkpoint. Yeah, so there were, there's a couple of things that we're looking at, right? The first one is there's that Cloud Guard SaaS that I hit on, which is I don't necessarily need to be a mobile worker, but I do have some applications on my phone, on my personal device, or maybe on a corporate device, but I'm on LTE, I'm not, you know, in the network. So the Cloud Guard SaaS is a key component for those common inbound applications like 365, like Salesforce, maybe ServiceNow, Box, uh, OneDrive, et cetera. The second component of it is what's called roaming user, and that is a VPN client that can be installed on either the desktop or on uh, a mobile device. 
and that creates the same traffic where instead of going from a Velo to a Velo gateway, it'll go from your device, you know, let's say you're sitting at Starbucks, you know, hopefully at some point in the near future, it'll be safe to work from a Starbucks again, uh, but it's going to go from your PC to Checkpoint. So we have the capability, we call that piece roaming user, uh, and that's for the secure internet gateway or for back home routing, meaning the ability to, from Starbucks, access a subnet in the data center or a resource locally like print services, et cetera, um, in your branch office. So two different ways that we achieve it, um, depending on what you're, you're looking for. The most probably traditional is that roaming user capability. Awesome. That, that's great stuff. I always you like to uh, finish early rather than late. Everybody needs to know that they're, we're going to keep them on schedule. So we'll do that. You Any last comments uh, that you want to? No obligation by any means. Yeah, I, I would just say thank you again. Um, I, I fully understand and, and appreciate the time. I think um, it was always one thing when we used to bribe people with lunch and learns and, and great events we've done with you guys over the years that, um, you know, the top golf, and we typically get to do some fun stuff uh, and reward your guys' clients and, and for the time. And so the commitment to join us today when, unfortunately, we aren't able to do it at a, a lunch and learn or a golf outing uh, speaks volumes to the relationship and, and the, value, the value that you guys provide to your clients. So thank you for the partnership with CBTS, and thank you to the end uh, clients for giving us your time today. Yeah, no problem. How about we'll address that one quick question here. Uh, I guess somebody wants to serve you up a, a tough one. Uh, what does the equipment stack look like? Oh, at our local ATC office. Good one, switch me up on that, yeah. The equipment stack at the local ATC office. Uh, I know you guys are on our, because I've seen the network side, we're on our VeloCloud SD-WAN, uh, and I believe our Meraki NAS. Uh, and I've seen a great demo room. I think that the, uh, Customer support, I believe, is on our host at UCAS, uh, but I know you guys do have a great setup for uh, that agnostic approach of the other 249 partners. I know I've seen uh, some of our competitors set up in there, but I've, I've, I'm not mistaken, keep me honest, your corporate network runs on and, and trusts the CBTS team. I'm sorry? Am I right? Yeah, I believe so. I, I missed the tail end of that because I'm trying to prepare for my closing remarks. Oh, yeah, I'd say I, I, <laughs> I, I believe that while you guys sell and, and partner with over 250 companies that the uh, your network was trusted to CBTS uh, from a network to yeah. run your corporate uh, office. Absolutely. That's our hometown partner. You know, Reds, Bengals, CBTS right there. <laughs> All right, good deal. We're right at two o'clock. Thank you very much, John. Uh, I'm going to keep it keep it quick. ATC, we know the product matrix at CBTS. Besides these gurus at CBTS, outside of them, we know they're better than anybody, bar none. So give us a call. Contact me at Louis at Forte for ATC, and we look forward to our our next event with CBTS. Thank you, and have a great day. Thank you.